This is not a topic of my choosing. About two months ago, Brother Chai Chai wrote to me and asked me, can I come to BF to give a talk? And he gave me this title. So I said, yeah, sure, no problem. No issue at all. And the irony of ironies is that next week at Sikya Inn in Malacca, which is one of the oldest Buddhist centers in Malaysia, Sikya Inn in Malacca is 100 years old. It started as a Buddhist center for the Nyonya Baba community of Malacca. That's why it's in English, such an old center, but using English because the Yonya, Bob, the, the, <coughs> the Yonya Babas in Malacca speak Malay and English. And they're going to have the same weekend leadership discussion, and they have invited me to talk on the same topic. <laughs> so I say, okay, very good. I just prepare one set. <laughs> So next week, a few of the members from here are going to Malacca to attend, so I will be seeing you there. You can ponting my, my talk and go and eat satay chalup. Now, but this is an important talk. I want to talk as invited on Buddhist leadership. And I'm going to look at the ideal and the harsh reality reflecting in the last two decades. And I particularly like that illustration that I've put up, where you have a light which is lighted and it's swinging like a pendulum and it's going to knock on all those other light bulbs in a row. Because whenever we talk of leadership, it is not just the leader, it is also the follower. So there are two groups of people, one group the leader and the other group the follower. So you can have good leaders, good followers. You can have bad leaders, good followers. You can have good leader, hopeless followers. And of course, the worst of the worst, you've got bad on both sides. <laughs> okay? Now, why this is important is because there are responsibilities on both sides for it to work. And the leader, as you see there, is a light bulb that is lighted up. He has an idea, he has a vision. And the duty of the leader is to be able to transmit that lighted bulb, that vision, to all these other bulbs that are in the line. So the reality is that every one of us in this room is a leader in some aspect of our life. Just like in that illustration, when the first bulb hits the second, let's say it gets lighted up, it hits the third. So every one of us is a leader whether on a macroscopic or microscopic level. But every one of us is. So the questions I ask myself when asked to discuss this topic is, first, how do we lead? Are there any examples we can follow? And even more important question is, why does anyone even want to lead? Why do you even want to? Why do you even bother? And of course, position statement, my reflections are limited to the border town of Johor Bahru and its surroundings. This is a small little area. So why do we even want to lead? The first and foremost is the leader. Somebody wants to lead. And he wants to lead in the Buddhist aspect is because he has a right view of something. He has some knowledge and he wants in his intention and in his thoughts, to be able to get a group of people to share this vision, to walk this path, so that you can reach this goal. That is something that he envisions. So it begins with the leader having a vision. He must have a view of what he wants to bring this group of people to. And with that right view and the right thoughts follow. So there is a goal. It's like a ship with a captain. If the captain has got no port to sail to, then you're just drifting aimlessly at sea. But when he has a vision and a destination, he knows exactly how to steer the ship in the right direction. And an example we can look at is the Bodhisatta, whose life we just celebrated at Versailles Day, who gave up wealth, family, and had only one goal to find the end of suffering. 
and to attain the answer to that question, he was willing to do anything in his personal capacity. So, you have to remember that now that we are leading a group, our foundation, the whole foundation of this fellowship or Meta Lodge or Sekia Inn for the matter, its whole foundation it stands on is that we are here to help other people. We are here to help other people acquire the right view and to have the right thoughts so that they can be better people. The guiding principle follows what the Buddha told the first group of his disciples who went out to share the Dhamma. And he said to them, go forth for the good and the happiness of the many. Now in this statement, sometimes is where we have to reflect that when we say for the good and happiness of the many, it includes the very people who are also doing this work. You have to remember that at the time when the Buddha sent the first group of disciples out, that first group of disciples were all Arahants. They were already very happy people. So for those of us who are in any society or lodge or temple, and we are now all volunteering to do something, yes, we want to volunteer for the greater group of our society, that everyone will have right views, right thoughts, and ultimately happiness. But we must not forget that this happiness, this right view, this right thoughts, includes the very people who are in this room. So you're not just self-sacrificing for the outside and seeing the people here have to work very hard and have very little in return. Because you need to also make you yourself very happy. So the leader first and foremost must unite a disorganized group into a single-minded group to achieve a purpose. You've got 100 people in here. Show as the sun will rise, there will be 99 differing views. But being all Buddhists on the path, our differing views are only in the minutiae. We are not differing on that we should kill all non-believers because they are infidels. No, we don't have such things. Our differing opinions are actually only in the minutiae because the big picture remains the same. The big picture is one education because with education, you have right view. The big picture is we must have meta to do what is good for us and for our society. And then you must make everybody happy because ultimately that's the goal, happiness. No one will volunteer to do anything that makes him unhappy. So the leader has to unite a disorganized group into a group with a single-minded purpose. So while the leader, he or she has the knowledge, the vision, and very important, the courage to change the status quo, he must also have the humility to realize that everyone is a volunteer, that everyone is doing it out of the goodness of their own heart. We are all working with volunteers, including whoever is the leader. And you will not be surprised that actually even serving together as volunteers allows many, many, many dangerous opportunities for friction, stress and unhappiness to arise. And that we got to look at from a very wise point, a very Buddhistic point. Because if not, you end up like what is in that diagram. Blind leading the blind. So what is leadership? Leadership is basically influence. Anybody who can influence the way you think, the way you act, the way you behave is a leader. All right? Anyone who can achieve that is a leader. Anytime you are in a position within your family, within your circle, where you can influence thinking, behavior, or development, you are already a leader. That's why I said every one of us is a leader. So you can well understand by now that good communication is essential. The light bulb that is lighted striking the second light bulb 
that I showed you at the beginning must be able to transmit that message of light to the next light bulb, to the next light bulb, to the next light bulb. Because good communication, when it fails at whatever level, you're going to end up with lots of friction because people now misunderstand. Okay? So we have to have good communication to be able to communicate our intentions and our visions for all to understand and to agree. Now, one of the models I admire is the one created by Brother Tan of Nalanda, whereby he's able to create so many second and third enchalon leaders to help promote the Dhamma work. That is not easy. To be able to create second and third enchalon leaders who share his vision is actually something very, very admirable. Now, it is communication not coercion, because all elected leaders in societies has authority but no power. So whenever we are in a position of leadership, we have to repeatedly check our own emotions, we have to check the emotional state of our volunteers, our followers, and we have to be mindful of what is happening. Now, the followers too must have their responsibilities. Why do you need a leader? You do not need a leader if everybody is just going downstream. No leader is needed. You need a leader because that leader has a vision. And that vision is to take you somewhere where you yourself on your own cannot go. So a person who is going downstream in a river, you just float along. You do not need a leader. But the leader is the one who goes upstream, who goes against the tide. And the Bodhisatta, on his night of enlightenment, you will recall, went against the tide. So a leader is someone who says, this is the status quo. I think that this status quo can be made better. I can improve it. I have a vision on how to improve it. And I'm going to motivate, I'm going to change everyone in here to move in that direction. It is not easy because, as I say, 100 people, you have 99 different opinions. Just to give you an example, Metal Lodge is very, very traditional. Metal Lodge is 34 years old this year. It's very traditional. Its traditions are almost cast in stone. So for years, people came, sat in meditation before the sharing, before the talk, before anything. Nobody talks to anybody because they observe noble silence. If you talk, people will go, shh. Okay? And all the chanting was in Pali, full stop, no jokes. At the end of the talk, by the Sayadaw, the Venerable, everybody says, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Then everybody pick up the cushion, put it back, and walk out. That's very traditional. That's still done in very traditional Burmese tradition temples and centers. So to change that was very difficult because it requires that the older generations accept that this is the 21st century and that we must adapt to the 21st century. And so change we must, but we have to be able to change it without offending the older generation. And so slowly we have to introduce chanting bilingually. And so with time, slowly that was accepted. Now we have bilingual chant. And I have just told them at Versailles Day that it will not be long where we will have to do trilingual chanting because you have a younger generation who don't speak English, they speak Chinese. And one of my younger members on my Thursday fellowship, she's a teacher, and she actually told me, Dr. Wong, if your Thursday fellowship is in Mandarin, then my students will come. Because most Chinese students now communicate in Mandarin. But because your Thursday fellowship is in English, they are hesitant. So to me, it's just a matter of time. We will have to be trilingual or you're not going to have young people. Versailles Day, for example. For years and years and years, Versailles Day in Metalodge means in the morning, everybody gathers, and then everybody will meet in the front. They will raise three flags. First flag, Nagaraku. Second flag, state flag. Third flag, the Buddhist flag, and singing the Mangala Sutta. Then everybody will go into the hall. Everybody will sit down. And then after that, the monks will sit down in a row, 
Then everybody will collect the rice and offer. After that, everybody will sit down, and then the monks will give the usual chanting. They chant the Metta Sutta, the Mangala Sutta, the Bhavantu. After that, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Then everybody follow the monk sit in the table, and everybody offer. And then after that, everybody go out. We bathe the Buddha, and then after that, everybody has lunch, and then we go home. For years, it was like that. And then you begin to realize that there is nobody under the age of 25 in the Versailles Day celebration. <laughs> nobody. Now, to change the Versailles Day celebration will almost get me excommunicated. <laughs> so we can't change that. So what I did some years ago was I said, yes, we will continue our Versailles Day because the older generation wants it like that. But we will have a Versailles Eve celebration. And the worst that Eve celebration is a party, a birthday party for the Buddha. I say, for heaven's sake, we are celebrating his birthday, so let's have a birthday party for the Buddha. And so on, worst Eve, we have a birthday party. Other than the birthday cake where he's not present to cut, we have everything. We have songs, we have performances. We've got so short puja that I guarantee the youths that before their legs ache, it's over. <laughs> okay? And so, with that, now all the youths, all my university students come and attend the Versa Eve celebration. They don't come for the Versa Day, they go for the Versa Eve. And of course, we will have a Dhamma sharing. But now anyway, even the Versa Day one already we have introduced a Dhamma sharing. Because we say it's meaningless if they just go there, do a ritual, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu and go home. Okay? So we have managed to change that. So we need change. That's for sure. Remember one of the Buddha's fundamental teaching is a Nietzsche. All things are changing. The only thing that doesn't change is the Dhamma. But the Dhamma has to be taught now in methods that are effective. You cannot speak in Shakespearean language today. No one will understand you, other than Brother Winston. <laughs> you go around talking about die and D. Who is going to understand you? Okay. So first, we have to be able to talk in a contemporary language. We have to be able to deliver in a medium of instruction that the young people can relate to. And this is a generation of instant everything. They are not going to sit there for one hour in silent meditation, waiting for a Sayadaw who's going to come and put a fan in front of him. You don't even see his face, you know. And he's literally talking to the fan for one hour. I don't blame the young. If I'm 15 years old, I also will run away and go to the mall. So we have to adapt. Okay? So you need someone who has that vision and say, look, we must change. And I'm going to drag every one of you up the river. I will make sure you don't drown, but I will drag you up the river. Because if we do nothing, then we will all continue down the river. And very soon, when the last person over the age of 80 dies in BF, that's the end. Okay, the members can divide the property or whatever is left in the bank. <laughs> That's what is happening to all our traditional Hui Kwans in Malaysia. You know, in Malaysia, every town you've got one Chan family association, and you've got one something something moral uplifting association. They're all basically mahjong clubs nowadays. <laughs> We're only about 10 or 9 very old, 80 year old men who are members. And then when they finally die, they sell the property and divide among the remaining. And that's what's going to happen if we don't adapt, because those Hui Kwan did not adapt. They stuck to their old ways. So leadership is also caring, meta in action, not just words. The effective leader not only has to be able to communicate, unfortunately, he has to be everywhere among his flock, because he has to be able to have time and the good emotional skills to provide support to his flock. And that is important because, as I said, a leader doesn't have any authority other than what is given by his followers. And that has to be earned. The Buddha, for example, led a very simple life. That is important. And a quality I admire is Uncle Vijaya. You see that man standing next to me? That's Uncle Vijaya. Uncle Vijaya has been doing Dhamma Sasana work from the time when I was a teenager. And he is still doing Dhamma work. 50 years of Dhamma work. 
longer than most of our working career. But yet he perseveres. Because successful leadership is not something that is very short. It takes a lot of time. Because to initiate change, for example, not only needs a person to initiate the change, then you have got to see through the change, and then you've got to make sure that the change is continued. That takes a lot of time and effort. Now, of course, the Buddha will have an advantage because he was exemplary in his conduct. He was literally a perfect being. But none of us, other than the Arahant in this room, is perfect. So because we are not perfect, the how of leadership now is transmitted through the guidelines of right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And right speech, I think, is where a lot of times there are problems because communication fails and people misinterpret intentions. And that is dangerous. So we cannot be perfect because we are still unenlightened beings. So we will make mistakes. So followers also have to realize that. But let the followers be inspired by how we deal with our imperfections. Because even the followers are similarly imperfect. So the right effort, the right mindfulness, and the right stillness to weather through storms is very important. Remember, every time you see the word concentration, substitute it with stillness. So we cannot make people follow us. We can only inspire people to want to follow us. And that is one of the most important duties of a leader. Because I can tell Vincent, do A, B, C, D, E. So Vincent, Vincent will do A, B, C, D, E faithfully for the first month. Maybe the second month, maybe the third month. But then when it gets repetitive, people get bored. So he must see a reason for him to continue to do it. That means he must be given a reason why he continues to do it. And that is what a successful leader is able to do, to inspire you to say, look, I know it's difficult, nobody said it's easy, but you will want to do it because you know it is right. And in doing it, you get happiness. Again, I revert to the example of Uncle Vijaya. 50 years of Dhamma work. You know, he was a very thin man when he started doing Dhamma work. Now he's wearing maternity-sized dresses. But he's still doing. The other day he was interviewed on Malaysian TV. Sorry, radio, because celebrating his 50th year. He's a teacher. Celebrating his 50th year as a teacher. So the radio recognized his contribution and there was an interview in the morning at how you can sustain 50 years of teaching. He is way past retirement age, but he's still teaching. So there must be a reason for him to carry on doing it over and over and over, year after year, month after month, week after week. And a successful leader is the one leader who can give you that reason to keep on doing it despite whatever obstacles. So. We have also to realize for the leaders that even if the leader is a superman, his troops may not be an un unlikely not. So the leader also cannot be over demanding because while he may personally be a superman able to do lots and lots of things, his followers may not be able to take the pace. So we have to be always very sensitive to feedback and sensitive to the mind state of the followers. Are they able to keep up? So we have to balance the two things. Simply put, a successful leader is one who is able to balance it. Okay? You cannot exhaust your troops because however incredible you may be, you might be doing that. You're walking way ahead of your troops. Your troops are already left far behind. So you always have to perceive what is happening on the ground. And the other thing the leader, whoever he or she is, has to always remember is that he can't do everything. He needs advice from peers or he will risk making very poor decisions. Let me give you another example. I have to begin by saying that I have never held any official position in Metalodge. In all these years, I am just a life member. But somehow or other, I always get roped in as patron of this, advisor to this, counsellor to this. But officially, I have not held any official position. So 
As it stands now, for example, I am patron and advisor to the MJ Club. MJ Club is the Meta Joy Club, and it is for children. Some years ago, maybe about 15 years or so, if you go to Meta Lodge on the weekends, you will find a group of retired teachers, and they will teach the Dhamma on the weekends to the children. And because all these were colonial teachers who retired, they still have the colonial headmistress mentality. Sit means sit, stand means stand, study means study, homework means homework. And we actually have canes in Metal Lodge. <laughs> and at the end of the year, we actually have a Dharma exam. So these kids will pass with distinction, this one failed, this one just barely passed. So the first thing when I was there is I had to change some of these things very subtly because who are you to teach people who have been teaching for 40 years of their lives? Professional pedagogists. And you are trying to teach them how to teach. And these are the ones who produce a generation of leaders in school. But we have to tell them that nobody fails a Dhamma exam because every one of us had failed our last Dhamma exam. That's why we are reborn. <laughs> <laughs> So the first thing we have to realize is we must never say anybody has failed your Dharma exam because you, teacher, also failed your Dharma exam. If not, you will be enlightened. So out with the exam, I said, please, let's don't have an exam. And please, let's get rid of the cane. We'll, next Mooncake Festival, all the canes were used to hold lanterns. <laughs> all right? And then the next thing was the Dharma class was a class-based class. That means we had little classrooms where the children were actually sitting there and studying like you study in a class. And I say, look, kids nowadays are very stressed. They go to school five days a week. They go for tuition every afternoon. Who wants to come to a class on the weekend and get some old lady on the front there telling you, study this, do this homework? So we had to change. We had to make it fun. And so we had to introduce that Dhamma must be taught to these children via music, via stories, via videos, via games. And because I'm in the university, it wasn't too difficult for me to round up all the young Buddhists in the university to come and help in Metal Lodge. Keep them busy also. Okay, so they were the ones who organized the games, for example. Now, then lately, they've got a teacher who is musically trained. And so they say, ah, finally, we've got one very talented music teacher. And so this teacher came, played the piano. Piano, no good. Okay, change piano. So now the big Yamaha. Okay. And then she said, okay, now all the teachers, all the adults come. And then for WhatsApp Day, we had a performance by the senior choir. And so she was very strict. Everyone must come in pants. Everyone must be in this color coat. And then start all singing. Okay? Now to my horror, the same thing was done in the MJ club. Meta Joy Club or MJ Club or Michael Jackson Club. <laughs> so the children immediately after the Dhamma class got to come down and then they will all sing. Then she will select you, 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 crook cannot, you, you. And then she started making a little choir of little children, which to my horror was completely unacceptable because I wrote a long letter to the Meta Lodge teachers and I said the whole principle of Meta Joy is to teach the children the Dhamma through music sadhu for the music. We are not here to create a choir. If you wish to create a choir, please do it at another time and you can pre present the Vienna Boys Choir for all I care. But we have to remember that on the MJ Club, every child, I don't care if he's croaking or whatever, he must sing because he is learning the Dhamma through the medium of music. We are not creating a choir. We are using it merely as the medium. So this is where you have to realize this, that when you get a music teacher, she's a leader, and she's very good, but she has already walked far from the crowd. She doesn't realize what is the aim of having the children sing on a weekend. And so we have to pull her back and say, please realize, we are not producing Manchester United, and we got Jose Mariano, which is you, to train. We are just getting the children to play football, and whether they can run, they can kick immaterial, as long as they're in the field, I'm happy. 
So this is something we have to realize because sometimes in the enthusiasm for you to do work, you begin to be very selective. And that's where you will break into cliques. Some will say, okay, la, I'm not good enough for this. Some will say, okay, I'm in this. And you get into problems. So you have to be very mindful of that because leaders are nothing without support. You cannot have leader or leaders without the followers. The only reason leaders are successful is because they got successful followers. Without successful followers, your leaders will achieve nothing. And another quality I admire, Uncle So, some of you will have known him. Okay? Without fanfare and very quietly, he has been supporting Sasana work for years. No questions. It's literally, you want to do something good? Okay, I want to help. How much money do you need? I will help you with that part because that is one aspect I can help you with. You want to build a temple? Fine. I will do the surveying work free because that is something I can do. Okay? So I admire him for years. He has been doing it very quietly. Those people who are not even in the Firefly mission won't even know how much he has contributed because he doesn't make any fuss about it. So the road is actually very long. If you see this picture, this is one of the old roads of Ho Chi Minh City. Now this is only half the road, another half of the road on this side. At the end of it is a temple. The old roads of Ho Chi Minh City doesn't look like the roads you are travelling on. These were the old roads. This was the actual road where the horse carriage and all that will go, the carts will go, at the end of which is the temple. See how narrow it is? See how long this road is? The road for any Dhamma Sasana work is similarly very, very long. And everyone in this room can contribute. Everyone in this room has got talent. Everyone in this room has got connections. Some got big connections, some got small connections, but everyone has a connection. And if we are willing to help, to volunteer, that connection is equally valuable. Whether your connection is to the uncle who makes cha kui tiao and sell on Versa Day to raise money, it's just as good. Leadership is creating change. If you do not want change, then do not have a leader. What for? Just have a manager. Then it's fine. Let's say everybody in this room says, we don't want change. We want BF to continue as it is. You do not lead a leader. You just need a very competent manager and he or she just continues doing whatever has been doing. Full stop. But as long as you want to have a leader, that leader will have a vision which hopefully everyone here shares and then changes will occur. But of course changes, as I said, have to be gradual. Now again, some time ago, I do not know whether BF is doing it, but when you offer food to the venerables, they will give you a blessing. So Priyo. And after that, you ask what does Soti Priyo mean? Ah? Nobody knows. Then it becomes a meaningless ritual. Now, meaningless ritual might be acceptable to the older generation, but I can assure you to the younger generation, they will have no interest in it. They will walk away. So I had to convince the venerables at Metal Lodge. Of course, I had a very good support of Venerable Mahachara, who, by the way, was the man who brought me to Metal Lodge many years ago. So Venerable Mahachara began now giving all the food offerings, all the blessings bilingually. So he would chant very briefly in Pali, then he would repeat the whole thing in English so that people can understand. Now these are changes. Slowly, slowly we change. But it is necessary or you're not going to have young people in this hall anymore. All right? So a manager's commitment, nine to five, no problem. We'll status quo. But a leader's commitment is 24-7. The leader is not here to get a life, but to create lives of defined purpose. And of course, you have to understand change is most difficult at the beginning. It is very, very difficult at the beginning to initiate change. And after you change, you have to demonstrate that whatever little changes I have done is good. Then people will be more willing to accept further changes. So it's very, very beginning, very hard, very, very messy in the middle. I think you are in the middle now. <laughs> but it is glorious at the end. Now this is another quality I admire. 
How many people in this room will be willing to spend the last 16 years doing free funeral services 24-7, 365 days? Very few. But you have one in your midst who started this in the year 2000 when providing free funeral service was something unheard of. So when he first started, he got no business, you know. <laughs> so I wrote him a letter and I said, Dear Brother T, when I die, you will do my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> Future undertaking signed and witness. <laughs> but that was 16 years ago. That's a lot of perseverance. Now what are our thoughts? First, to summarize, a vision. Again, I repeat, whoever you elect as your leader has a vision that he wants this grouping of people to move into the 21st century using whatever means he is thinking of. So he has that vision and he has to be able to communicate that, communicate that vision to everyone so that those of you will see, yes, that is very admirable. We want to support that vision. Or if nobody here wants any changes, the vast majority say, we want status quo, we want to be a mahjong club that just play mahjong on weekends, then you just have a manager to run the place. No changes are needed. And then you end up like a hui kwan. So if you get a leader who's going to drag you up river, he will make decisions. Those decisions, the quality and the accuracy. No one is perfect. Of course, some decisions are very good decisions. Some decisions might be controversial. Some decisions might cause a lot of disagreements. But whatever it is, we have to look at the reason behind those decisions. They can be discussed. They can be modified. They can be adapted to the needs. Because as I said, while a leader may be a superman, the troops may not be. So the leader also have to realize that. So the precision of how this vision and this decision goes downstream is very important because conflicts arise when once it goes downstream, that is lost. The vision is lost. If you talk to psychologists, they'll tell you that when you make decisions, you have rational intelligence which says one plus one equals two. So you can have a very rational person like LKY. Everything is argued out by sheer force of logic that because L, 1 plus 1 is 2, and 2 is the best answer. Sheer force of logic. And then you have people who make decisions by intuition. You sense what these people are, and then you make. And then you've got very, very rare breed of people who've got superb emotional intelligence. They are the people who are able to make decisions that make everybody happy. Okay? But I think that in the Buddhist circle, the most important one is the spiritual intelligence. The ability to make everyone in you, of you in here, see why am I coming on a Sunday, why am I coming for a meeting, and why am I doing it, and I will continue to do it. He has given you a reason and a meaning to continue. That will be the most important. So the leader helps you find meaning in doing what you do. But we must never move away, eh? right from the Buddha's day when he said the first batch is sent out, that our primary role is education, creating right views and right thoughts. That's our primary role. The rest is merely the medium. So is it a classroom like Metal Lodge in the old days, where you have very fierce, retired, Kirby-trained teachers? Or is it the humble guitar of the 70s, where Victor Wee was a very young man and I was in secondary school, the Simon and Garfunkel era, where a single guitar, Oh, suffering world, you shall not come back again. Very haunting words. When I was a teenager, my first question is, what do you mean, oh, suffering world, you shall not come back again? <laughs> <laughs> but it makes you think. Just a humble guitar. Or is it the concerts of the 21st century? Imi Ui, for example, grand concerts. Or is it just simple audiovisual entertainment? Or is it like Ziqi through altruistic acts? Endlessly doing altruistic acts and you learn in that course of doing it. There's no right answer. Depending on the people who are the followers and the leader, any one of these 
can be the means. Anyone. All right? So the reality we have to accept is that your education talks about reality. The other people talks about promises. And most people will rather believe a lie that is very beautiful than believe a truth that is very harsh. I have often said, it is so beautiful to accept. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Seek and you shall find. Ask and it shall be given to you. Who doesn't want that? I've been knocking on Vincent's doors. Nothing happened. <laughs> but that's a beautiful promise. And anyone would want to listen to that promise. Anyone would want that. Now that is what you are going to teach people. You are trying to teach people to accept the painful truth rather than to believe beautiful lies. And that's not easy. So this education has to go through very effective means of communication that young people can relate to. Of course, there'll be disagreements, the traditional, the new, the conservative, the modernist. You have to be balanced because you have got old people. So we still have to chant in Pali. We still have to give the Soti Priyo because there will be people who want that. We still have to go through all the rituals because there are people who need that. While on the other hand, you also have to cater to a modern generation. So it's not a right or a wrong, it's the most appropriate. Now, leaders have to earn the respect and trust, unfortunately, it's not something automatic. And I think that the most important one is to help those in the corners because those are the ones that once you help, they are there forever. Let me give you examples. This is what Brother Tan told me a few years ago. What can be more important than the Buddha Dharma, he said. Work, eat, sleep, repeat the whole thing again and again. What is more important than the Buddha Dharma? So you will see as he has dedicated his whole life to the Buddha Dharma because he cannot see anything else more important than that. Of course, I'm not saying that everyone in this room can do the same thing. We have to strike a balance. Now, leadership is to be involved in everyday life because the Dhamma is about everyday life. And the dana of time, I have found in my experience, when in grief, is the most important. I have done funerals, I have done weddings, etc., etc. That night when you had your concert, the first day I couldn't come because there was a memorial service that I had to conduct. And I find that very, very important. My best students, inverted comma, are those members of families that I have done funeral services. The rest, you hear about the truth. They had a direct experience with truth. One of my most devoted followers now in our Thursday fellowship is a man and his wife whose son died at the age of 20. 20 years old, the son died. So I just received a call in the morning, so-and-so nephew has passed away. The uncle comes to my Thursday fellowship regularly. So Brother Hing called me up and said, so-and-so's nephew passed away suddenly. Can you do the funeral service? So I said, whose son? Then they mentioned the name. I've never heard of the fellow. He's a life member of Metal Lodge. He hasn't been there for at least the last 15 years. <laughs> but he's a life member. I've never even seen him. But anyway, we say, never mind, we will do it. So that night, I went with all my paraphernalia, as usual. I arrived there. There was this man in his 50s who saw me coming, walked towards me, hugged me, and cried. Literally cried. That's the father of the boy, 20 old years old, who died. He cried. And then, of course, we did the funeral service. Okay, we did whatever we can. And then we taught him how to help, etc., etc. We arranged for venerables to go to the house for house dana, etc., etc. So after this very traumatic event, every Thursday he faithfully comes for fellowship. Every event we have, he volunteers. First Saturday he was the GC, a GW. He called himself the general worker. Come clean this, clean that, mop that, mop that. So now he tells you that tells us that I have been to Metal Lodge more times in the last about four months than in my whole entire life. Because he has seen the truth 
and he realized the importance of the support. Okay, wedding one, not so effective. Laugh, 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 happy, happy, after that, disappear, never see again. Okay, in fact, Buddhist Fellowship Indonesia tell me all the fellows who get married disappear. So now I, I told Venny and Irvin, I said, next time when they get married, make them sign agreement, must serve one year in the committee, if not, we won't marry you. <laughs> because they both complain to me, all get married and disappear. Sister Jenny, for example, got married, disappear, <laughs> never come back again. So we say, must sign agreement, one year serve in a committee, then only can disappear. <laughs> but the funerals, I find, when you give them that sort of support at a time where people really need support, and I always tell people, even if you don't know what to say, it doesn't matter. I make sure that my Thursday fellowship, whenever there is someone who passes away within our circle, all of them turn up. I say, even if you don't know what to say, it does not matter. Your presence is what is important, to show that you care. That is important. So the truth is actually clearest when confronted. Louis can translate you, this line, saat menderita itulah saatnya lebih menjadi bijak. The seconds that you spend in grief, those are the seconds which will train you to become more wise. It is about being an example. And I was very, very happy that one of our brothers in this room sent me this photograph. Because I told them as Buddhists, we talk about knowing the way to happiness. We talk about understanding the second noble truth. We talk about metta, karuna, etc. So we should be very, very happy people. If we are not very happy people, something is wrong. You are not walking the Buddhist path. Because if you are walking the Buddhist path, you should be a very happy person. Oh, there's one brother who told me, oh, I bought these shares, then I sold it, I made a little profit. And after I sold it, the shares went up five times as much. Then he said, I rejoice, whoever bought my share made a lot of money. <laughs> I rejoice for that man. He made so much money. I made a little, but he made a lot. I rejoice for him, which is good. That's the correct attitude. That's the correct attitude. Then you'll be very happy. All right, then you'll be very happy. Okay, so this brother sent me that he actually wrote this and put it at the back of his door. Buddhists know the way to happiness and the end of suffering. We should be very happy people. If you are not, something is very wrong. So you all should be very happy people. If there is a lot of unhappiness, something is wrong. Either there is not right speech, either there is not right action, or there is not right livelihood. So be so happy that people want to know why you are so happy. You're either mad or you really know the secret to happiness. And please remember, this is something I learned from my good friend who has been active in Rotary for 30 over years, doing all kinds of things. Earthquake in Chile, he's on the next plane to Chile. Tornado in, in Philippines, he's on the next plane to Philippines. Floods in Kelantan, he's on the next lorry to Kelantan. So we used to ask him, how do you find the energy, look, you're not going for a holiday, you know, you're going to a place where people are all running away from. Earthquake, everybody run away, he go in there. <laughs> Tornado in Philippines, everybody run away, he goes in there. So we say, how, how can you be so happy? He said, first, of course, the happiness of doing what I'm doing, knowing that I'm helping some people. And of course, he will lead a group of medical students. And he always makes sure that the group he leads, they will have a nice time besides doing the work. They will have nice food, you take them around, jalan-jalan here and there, see this, see that. Because as he said, volunteerism is one thing, but the volunteers must be happy. They must have rest and recreation, because if not, they will give up. So it is so important that we have to make everyone happy. The leader also must be made happy, you also must be made happy. So are you a servant leader or a self-serving manager? Managers consider their own interests first above all others. But servant leaders consider are the first before their own. And we are here to serve, not to be served. Compare this with the world leaders who live in the laps of luxury. I don't have the name names. Okay, and this occurred even during the Buddhist time. Now youth leadership is even more unique because you've got to speak the Dhamma in the contemporary language of the youth. You have to be their friend. You have to realize that they are leading lives in a very rapidly changing world. So whatever you do, you have to adapt to their changing world. 
You've got to see their needs. And what do teenagers basically want? Fun. You know, that night at Versailles Eve, the, the teacher I told you who, who wants to bring students, she did manage to bring a few of her students to come and attend the Versailles Eve service. And so I always tell people, first bring in the pretty girls. After you bring in the pretty girls, the boys will come. <laughs> and this teacher, this school teacher told me, Dr. Wong, you are absolutely right. Because when I asked my students, I said, tonight I'm going to Versa Eve service, I want to bring some of you there. Their first question is, will there be pretty girls? <laughs> okay? It's not whether you like it or you don't like it. It's reality. That's the reality. And I've even changed the word sadhu. Last night, no, sorry, last afternoon at the Indonesian chapter of Buddhist Fellowship International. You know, we've got a Buddhist Fellowship International. And then we've got Jakarta chapter, we've got Malaysia chapter, we've got Singapore chapter. So at the Indonesian group, Singapore chapter, we had a gathering where we shared the Dhamma. And I told them, do not, I shared about Upadana, about rites and rituals. Part of it was rites and rituals. And I said, even things which are wholesome can become degenerate into rites and rituals. An example, I said, Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Nowadays, that has been de degenerated into a mere rite, a mere ritual with no meaning. At the end of offering, at the end of whatever, people say, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Why? Because traditionally, we have to say it, so we say it. No meaning. It becomes a rite. And the Buddha said, rites are part of the upadanas, part of your fetters which holds you back. You have to get out of it. You have to remember that during the Buddha's time, when he spoke, People could understand what he said. The Pali is just like you and I talking in Cantonese or Hokkien. They could understand. And at the end of it, they say, wow, this is wonderful. This changed my life. This explains so many things. It's like at your concert, you say, Angkor, Angkor, Angkor. Now, the Buddhist equivalent of sadhu in the present day and age for a young person, if he could understand the Buddha's teaching, is awesome. Wow, this is awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It has meaning. It has power behind it. Not sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. After that, nobody will know what. You ask, I'm sure you ask the young people what does sadhu mean. They have no idea what it means. Why you say it? Because mother say, put my hand together and say sadhu. Okay? Now, this is an actual testimony from a youth. You read it yourself. This is an actual testimony from one of my medical students. <laughs> if we carry on with this, we will have no young people. Okay? I just cut and paste it. An actual testimony from a medical student whose mother is a very good devotee. Faithfully goes for chanting everything. Okay? Hence, we have to adapt. Youths would come only when they can bring their friends to come. No friends, no one will come. Because they, are, they have hurt mentality. Everybody go means all oh, go. No one go, oh, you don't want to, no one go. One okay? All right? So first, you must give them something to look forward to and say, my friends also want to come. That means we have to come up with creative programs that they enjoy. You have to meet their needs, not our expectation. It takes a lot of work to arrange, to find videos, to find music that is relevant to Dhamma discussion. But it must be done. We have no choice. You and I have no choice. Remember, we have to meet their expectation, not our expectation. Versailles Day 2015, Jakarta. It was like a rock concert. 2,000 youths attended Versailles Day celebration. 2,000. I spoke to Brother Kwang Wei before I left. He said, if I can get 200 in Singapore, I rejoice already. <laughs> but they managed to get 2,000 because they gave the youths what is needed. It is literally like a rock concert. But in between, of course, all the songs were Dhamma songs. I was asked to be the speaker, so I spoke on two sessions. It's about a three-hour program of intense music, and then in between, two Dhamma talks. And then in between, interview with successful youth leaders, very, very successful youth leaders, wider business people, 
or very successful in the social side, helping the poor, helping the prisoners. Not old people. The only old fellow is me. <laughs> the rest are all young fellows. Okay? So 2,000 people attending, standing, screaming, waving. And of course, Brother Irwin Wongso was playing the music. Okay? Look at that. 2,000 youths in a huge hall. Brother Irwin playing the piano. They got professional bands playing Dhamma music. And it costs a whole lot of money. The youths who come only need to pay a very small sum which covers their meals because they give them food as well. So they only pay a very small sum which cover the meals that they eat. The rest were all sponsored by the adults. It was a huge sum. Okay? And there were of course people who criticised. There were even people who asked me, Dr Wong, why do you take part? I said, if next year they organise it, I will take part again. I said, where else are you going to get 2,000 youths to come? So we have to be able to be, re we must be realistic that we have to teach the Dhamma. Of course, it's educational. But now the means of delivery has to be adopted to this generation. See, even old men like me also sing. And the other thing I told them is that you have to be a walking billboard for Buddhism. Every one of you in this room, there are about 100 over people. Imagine if 100 over people here are walking billboards. At any time, there are 150 people walking around Singapore promoting Buddhism. Now in sales, this is called noise. You know people who are in sales, they will always have to create background noise because if not, your product is forgotten. You must always have events, promotions, etc. Subluminal conditioning by the roadside. Toyotaya. It doesn't matter. Every time you pass, you see it. You see it a hundred times, it gets into your brainstem. It's subliminal conditioning. Okay? Now, we need that in Buddhism. So I want all 150, one of, 150 of you to make t-shirts like me. <laughs> so that you're a walking billboard. Okay? Now, those are the intonations. So when I went, I made these t-shirts and brought it to them and gave it to them to wear during the WhatsApp event. Okay, I said you have to be hip. You have to advertise. Now the other thing in the youths which I learned from Vietnam is the Vietnamese also have very successful youth programs. And how do they do it? The Vietnamese are very conservative. Their branch of Buddhism is Mahayana Zen. So theirs is very traditional. Every evening, every morning, chanting, 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 meditation, meditation, meditation. But yet they are able to attract Lots of youths to go to the temple. And I'm so surprised because Ho Chi Minh City is horrendous traffic jam. And for the youths to come, they literally have to fight the traffic like crazy. And yet, they are so successful. Okay, these are just more examples of walking billboards. Okay? You can print all this yourself. Johor Bahru, only 20 ringgit, you can print. You bring your own T-shirt. Print it on the spot, they give it to you. 20 ringgit. Then the ones I printed at the back, 20 ringgit. Okay, you choose your word, I am sexy, no problem, 20 <laughs> minutes. Okay, 20 ringgit on the spot, holiday plaza. You can make one, he's gay, and then put one arrow, point that way. <laughs> also, no problem, no question asked. You pay them 20 ringgit, they print for you. So be in, be one with the youth leaders. This is my university students at Metal Lodge. Okay. So I told them, other than taking away the main Buddha image, you can do anything in the hall. <laughs> anything else you can do, as long as you just don't take away the main Buddha image. I'm not, how am I going to find one so big? Okay? Other than that, you can do anything. Okay? So where youths gathers, adults are facilitators, not leaders. Do not calendar the same events recurrently. It is boring. No one will come. Do not have information overload. Youths have very short attention span. So if we give them Dharma talk, half hour, that's all. Because their attention span is short. Do not dismiss feedback. If the youths, you see them fidgeting there, you know your talk is boring. Okay, you see one fellow at the back falling asleep, you're done for. <laughs> so celebrate every occasion, every birthday, every achievement. Celebrate. Make it a big thing. 
That's important. You know, when my oldest daughter was in convent school before she went to uni, convent school in JB, Friday afternoons they have religious classes. The students select. So they got Christian fellowship, they got Buddhism, one nun comes and teach them, they got Hindu, then they got Muslim. My daughter tells me she goes to the Christian one. Why? She said, got free pizza. <laughs> now you have to understand, that's what the youths want. You say you go to the Buddhist one, so boring, you know, the nurse, the nun sit there, life is suffering. <laughs> <laughs> and then no food. <laughs> So she said, we all go to the Christian one. Because Christian one, pizza. Another week, KFC. So you have to realize, to the youth, this is important. Food is important. Okay? And when my daughter was in Nottingham University in UK, every Sunday she's Christian. Because every Sunday she says from the local church, all these old ladies who come in their cars, they'll go to all the university hostels, and they'll pick up all the kids. Then they'll drive them to the church, they attend the service, then they have all free lunch at the church, and then they bring them back to the hostel where you dang saranang gachami. <laughs> they said no Malaysian and Singapore student will turn down a free meal. Say, you give me a free meal, I'll be a Christian tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we learn that this is what they need. So if you want your youth program to be successful, you have to give them food. Not your food. Not your boring vegetarian food. They want KFC. They want Nando's. Okay? Correct. So, the Ehi Pasiko Foundation is a foundation in Jakarta run, led, led by a brother called Brother Handaka. He's amazing, I tell you. He's coming to Sekia Inn next week. When Sekia Inn organized this about a year ago, they wrote to me, I told them you must bring Irvin. That time Irvin was unknown. Okay, I say you bring Irvin because his music has transformed Indonesian Dharma sharing. But they knew about Handaka, so they were going to invite Handaka. And Handaka is amazing. He has the mind of a child. He knows exactly what the children want. So besides the T-shirt, which we already know, his T-shirts are very innovative because they are designed by youths for youths. This aren't designed by old men. Young people don't want this. Okay. And here's things, every child carries a school bag. Why do we not make a school bag with a Buddhist logo? It is noise. You are carrying a subliminal message all the time. Okay? So let's say you go to one rural school, 1,000 children. I am sure this community here can sponsor 1,000 school bags. What's the big deal? I am sure. Okay, so you got 1,000 school bags distributed to a rural school where they are going to school in little cloth bags. Everybody is very happy. He makes rubber. You know your little rubber? Your Pokemon thingy there? Instead of Pokemon, he has got a Buddhist message. He makes pencil cases. And the list goes on. Things that a child would want. And he makes cartoons. He's teaching children through cartoons. This is from Indonesia. Okay. And he uses movies, songs. Star Wars, train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. I showed you all that yesterday <laughs> at the Saturday afternoon. Okay. A song. I have to confess I have not heard this song, but my young people, my youths tell me they have heard this song by Natasha Bedingfield. I don't know what is this song, but it's actually a song. Today is where your book begins. The rest is still unwritten. And then he has got comics and colouring books for children. The one at the top is a colouring book. Amazing method of transmitting Dharma. And of course, I congratulate you all. Very successfully you run this, because I think this is what the next generation will need. The only thing I was a bit disappointed was when I was at the hall, I didn't see much publicity in posters. Maybe you are limited by the authorities there. But I didn't see much publicity as far as posters were concerned. So that means you're only limited to the people who bought tickets. Because noise is for the public. We could have advertised in other ways to make people aware. But this is what we need. This is what we need. So while it may cost you a lot of money, you need it.
because there are lots and lots which are what we call soft things that you cannot measure as a return. Okay? And part of it is noise. Now, in Vietnam, they are very successful, just like what Brother Tan is doing in Nalandas. They're teaching the youth life skills. Isn't that Dhamma too? That's Dhamma. All over the Nalanda centers, they have free tuition. Okay? Tuition for English, tuition for science, tuition in Malay, tuition in maths. Every child needs tuition nowadays. If you don't send your child to tuition, it almost makes you look as though you are a very poor parent. Okay? So, Nalanda provides free tuition. Even the Johor Bahru branch also provides free tuition. And based on this model, now Metal Lodge is also starting. They've got volunteer teachers who come and give free tuition. Now, in Vietnam, they are very successful because everybody in Vietnam wants to learn English. They know that that's the future. The temples teach English. You teach English via the medium of Dhamma and people come. Of course, not in Singapore. Here, you have to teach French or something like that. <laughs> but there, they teach English. Okay? This is a Sunday afternoon in a very traditional temple. These are the youths that come every Sunday afternoon. And the other thing is the leaders have to go outside to society. This is a breast cancer society that invited me. Everybody who is a member there has breast cancer. When you talk to these people, you're talking to people who know what is anicca, who know what is dukkha, who knows what is anatta. Okay? And of course, you need connections. We need to learn, teach, inspire, and be inspired. Remember, if you're going to hang out with chickens, you're just going to go kapow, kapow, kapow. You hang out with eagles, you're going to fly. So we need to constantly hang out with people who can give us new ideas, inspire us. And of course, this is Buddhist Fellowship International. International because the food we eat is international. <laughs> We eat Indonesian food, Singapore food, Malaysian food, Western food, Japanese food, Korean food, and that's why we are international. We must continuously learn from and be inspired by others because one of the biggest dangers facing anyone who is leading is burnout. And that's why also leaders cannot be too long because after a while you run out of ideas. But you can't be too short because you can't carry your ideas through. So it's very easy to be excited about something initially, but after a couple of years, it's very hard to maintain that. And of course, not to forget one's own family. Comes with a price. Guess which is my car and which is my student's car. <laughs> Look at the color code of my t-shirt and you will know the answer. <laughs> so no one said it's easy. The Buddha didn't have an easy time. He had a very difficult time for 45 years trying to teach the Dhamma. And sometimes, despite all that we do, we fail our goals. But it's all right, because we are not talking about short-term goals. As long as what you are doing inspires another generation of leaders to carry on, you are successful. Because some goals cannot be achieved in one year, two years. So we try our best. You open any leadership book, you will find all these things. Okay? Vision, decision, take risks, know yourself, motivation, etc., etc. Any book will teach you this. Now, the leader cannot be good in everything. Please remember, everyone is good in something. I've got Anatta Pindika sitting in front of me here. <laughs> I've changed his name. He's no, long Je no more Jerry Ong. He's Ananda Pindika Ong. <laughs> okay? And then on the other side, you have Sister Wani and her husband, Brother Indra. They are very successful businessmen. If you go to Indonesia and you buy a diamond, chances are the diamond you buy is from them because they run a whole franchise of shops selling high-end, middle-end, low-end diamond jewelry. But yet, they have devoted their entire life to sharing the Dhamma, using their resources. She's the principal sponsor of the Youth Conference 2015. Where do you think that huge sum of money came from? She and her family. Now, this is Sister Doris in a wheelchair. Sister Doris is in, is in Metal Lodge. So, Metal Lodge is building a new building. It's going to cost us $9 million. In this age of poor economy, how are we going to raise $9 million to build that new building? So, all kinds of ideas 
people raise. And Sister Doris in a wheelchair is a very, very respected Ikebana master. She's a grandmaster of Southeast Asia. She got students all over Singapore, Malaysia, Jakarta, everywhere. And so she came up with an idea and she said, first, if you're going to raise money within the Buddhist community, not enough. You have to be able to raise money across all. That means you have to expand your wings, not just within the Buddhist community, because you cannot keep on getting it from the same people. You have to make it big. So she said, I will organize a fashion show based on flowers, based on Ikebana. We will sell Ikebana. Okay, so you have lots and lots of Ikebana everywhere, made by her students, put up for sale to be donated to this good cause. And then she got all these models she convinced them to donate their time, so they came and they donate their time. So what the models didn't know is they were actually walking to the sound of Metta Sutta. Awa <laughs> Abiro Homi, and the models were walking, walking. Well, well, that part they didn't know. <laughs> but they donated their time. There were about four international designers who volunteered. Okay, at least I think two came from Singapore. And so they had a very successful afternoon, and she invited people from all boards of society, including Johor royalty, to come and support. And so they managed to raise 120,000 from this one afternoon event. Okay? So a little lady seated in a wheelchair, but with a great idea. So that's why I said every one of us is a leader. It's only whether we tap on what you can offer or not. Okay? So at the end of the day, close your eyes, be content with what we have done, be proud of who we are. Even if what we have set out to do is not successful, don't worry, the road is very long. As long as there's continuity, it will succeed. Conclusion is not about power, it's not about control, but about inspiring. It's not about domineering people, it's about giving people that meaning, that reason to go on serving. And one of the greatest gifts we can give is happiness, hope, comfort. Okay? So we have to build a constellation of people, not just one star, but many, many light bulbs, like in this hall. Life is too short. Please do not waste it by being unhappy. Okay? What is the secret to long life, oh wise one? The secret to long life is easy. Don't smoke, don't drink, don't overeat. But the secret to happiness is an entirely different matter. And we Buddhists know the secret to happiness. So you must be very happy people. Thank you. <laughs> All right. You all better take a good rest before your AGM this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, the time is 12.10. Do you have time for Q&A, Dr. Wong? I have time, you may not have time. <laughs> Perhaps uh, questions from the floor. Then. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong, recently I read an article, uh, I think it was on here. Here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I think it was on Huffington Post about a lot of Christian, a uh, small group of Christian youth. Well, not exactly small, but a trend of Christian youths who are turning away from rock concerts. I tried to fish out the article, but I couldn't find it. But I found something similar, and it's saying that um, today something unexpected is happening. There's a small, distinct movement of young people abandoning the smoke machines, multi-purpose buildings, celebrity pastors of recent church models, heading back towards traditional worship services, where sacraments are central buildings, are beautiful, the liturgy has a history, historic rootedness about it. And so what is going on? Young people today have been marketed to all their lives. They can see past gimmicks and tricks. They don't need church to pretend to be something it's not an entertainment venue, a relationship course, a nightclub. They find it refreshing to enter a building which openly proclaims itself as a worship space, to take part in ceremonies and, rhythm, and rhythms which unashamedly focus on worship. They swap the salesman's pitch for simple sacraments. So um, I was thinking to, to see if you've got any 
comments on something yeah, like course, that. Yeah, of course, don't 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 abandon the old, preserve the old, because there will always be people who, would, like the more senior members, the more conservative members, they will require the old form. I mean, strictly speaking, none of you in this room need to do any rites and rituals. But why do we do it? Because we need it. Why do you need to do all the offerings? Not because the Buddha needed it, but because you and I need it. We need it for psychological support. We need it for psychological strength. Why do we need funeral services? Strictly speaking, funeral services don't, don't do anything. But we need it for psychological support, for a rite of passage. So many, many of these things are done because you and I need it. So please do not go away with the idea that I'm telling you to abandon the old. No, we built on the old because there will be people who will need the chanting. There will be people who need the rosaries. There will be people who need to make the offerings because they, found lot, they find lots of comfort in it. But on the other hand, you also have another segment that doesn't require it. So that's why we have to be able to provide both to strike a balance that while Asia modernizes into the 21st century as Western culture takes over what will be our traditional culture, we have to be able to cater to the needs of these people who see it as the present medium, but maintaining that which provides for the older generation. Okay? So, see, like America now, if that what is reported in Huff the Huffington Post is right, you will have a small movement of people who are going back. Okay? Nothing surprising. Things go in circle. If I've kept my pants of the 1980s, you'll be top fashion now. All right? Yes, thank you. One last question. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Uh, maybe some two related questions. Um, the first one is that you, you want to go contemporary and attract people, right? So the Vinaya 227 uh, are already very, some of them are very outdated. So is there a room to, to modernize that, to bring it to contemporary and then attract more people to, to the monkhood? And then the related question, the diabolically opposing question is that if you go the, the, the route of modernizing, keeping up to the modern times, there's also the danger of, of uh, contaminating the, the, the Dharma. You know? So how do you uh, talk about these two related questions? Okay, first question is of course with regards to the Vinaya. Now the Vinaya is not our business to change because none of us are in a position nor do we have the moral authority to change it. But the Vinaya is only limited to the monks. You have to remember that when we say you walk a middle path, that middle path differs from people to people. My middle path and your middle path is the five precepts. When you and I stick to the five precepts, we are walking our middle path. But for the monks, it's 227 guidelines. Okay, it's not five precepts. For the serious meditator, eight precepts. For the even more serious one, 10 precepts. So that path that you and I choose differs. Okay, as to whether you should modernize the Vinaya, none of us in this room are in a position to. Even though the Buddha himself is recorded to have said that the minor rules can be adjusted. And you will remember that during the Buddha's lifetime, he kept adjusting it to suit the times. Okay? And none of us are the Buddha. So we are not in a position now. And it was also the decision taken by the early elders that they will not change anything. So we are not in a position to make any adjustment. Although having said that, having said that, there are already many, many traditions which do not stick very strictly to certain aspects of the Vinaya. That means they allow the laxity of the monks to travel in a car, to travel in a bus, to travel in various forms of public transport. And this was told to me by one of the venerables in, in Burma. He said in the Buddhist days, they traveled by bullock cart. So it was considered not very acceptable for a monk to be seated in a cart where the fellow is whip, whipping the bullock in front. But he said nowadays we don't whip a bullock anymore. We travel in a bus or we travel in a car. So strictly speaking, that Vinaya rule, no one keeps very strictly now. Okay, because it is going to be very difficult for the monks to travel if they are not allowed to sit in some form of common transport. So while the rules stand there, but they are not very, very strict in implementing it. For example, the monks are not allowed to eat garlic. 
Because in the old days, apparently, after the monks ate garlic and then they gave Dhamma talk, people. Ugh. So now, they are not that strict. Another rule, for example, you're all supposed to be seated on the floor in front of the monk when he's giving a Dhamma talk. The reason being, in those days, there were no chairs and people sat on the floor. Okay, and it's supposed to be a measure of respect to the Dhamma. But nowadays, many of the people in the audience are very old and it's going to be very difficult for them to sit on the floor. So chairs became acceptable. And I'm very, very inspired by what they did in the main Vihara in Jakarta. You know, they sit on the floor like that, but they've got trenches. So the feet is actually inside the trench. So they actually seated like that. And then when they stand up, they fold the thing back, which is the cushion, boom, it becomes flat. So when it opens, it's a cushion. They sit here, the feet enters the trench. So I spoke to the engineers who are doing the new Metalodge building, and I said, can you do this? He said, can, but it's going to cost us a lot of money. <laughs> because it literally means you've got to elevate the whole floor, one level, with an empty space underneath for you to put your feet in. So he said, it's going to cost a lot of money if we are to do that. Okay, but these are the things which have been modified. Now the second question with regards to the danger of contaminating the Dhamma, ah, the danger for contaminating the Dhamma through the medium of modern education, I think is less dangerous than what is being done by people who teach the Dhamma to suit their own objectives. Nowadays, there are lots of people who go around teaching the Dhamma more to suit their own objectives. And that's why you see all kinds of funny, funny splinter groups promoting all kinds of Dhamma. So how do we tell that the Dhamma that BFI is going to share must be not contaminated? Actually, the Buddha gave us the answer. Okay, He gave that answer when the last disciple asked him on the deathbed. And I'm going to summarize it to make it easier. We say in Chinese, Ba Wan Si Qian Fa Men. That means there are 84,000 Dhamma doors in which you can walk in to learn the Dhamma. Okay? That means you can walk in through the door of Zen, you can walk in through the door of the Vinaya, you can walk in through the door of BF, etc. etc. 84,000 doesn't take it literally. It just means many doors are open for you to learn the Dhamma. But all of these doors must have got a common basis. It must have the eight, the eightfold path. Whatever the door you are entering must teach you the eightfold path. You must have the four. Whatever the door you are entering must teach you the four noble truths. And you must have the three zeros. It must teach you anicca, dukkha, anatta. Whatever teaching that you are involved in that does not have this eight, four, zero, 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 you have contaminated the Dhamma. Because the Dhamma's very foundation is the Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths, and the Three Universal Characteristics. Ba Zhen Tao, Si Shen Di, San Fa Ying. If you don't have that, you have deviated from the Dhamma already. Okay? So make sure, whatever medium you are teaching, it must have this in your syllabus. If not, you have already gone beyond what is Dhamma into A Dhamma with a small little A in front. Okay? Thank you awesome. 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 Uh, thank you, Dr. Wong.